Hello learners, in the second video related to architectural functional categories, let us look at the various monuments from the perspective of its functional categories. In this video, we will focus on the religious architecture as well as the strategic architecture, the concept of sarai as well as bridges that are important part of the Indian architectural style. Now, let me start with the religious architecture. The religious buildings performed a lot of function in Indian society. The religious activities were oriented towards social welfare. So, we have lot of specimen of religious architecture which date back to the beginning of Indian civilization. In this video, we will try to discuss the development of religious architecture in India. Learners, the Harappan town of Mohenjo-daro provides us a specimen of the earliest buildings. The Harappan civilization was deciphered through the study of architecture and its remains. I hope that you all are aware about the famous Great Bath of Mohenjo-daro, which is a brick built structure and can be approached through steps. The bed of the bath was made by watertight material. The water was supplied by a large well in an adjacent room and there was a good drainage system that was part of the entire structure. Generally, this place was used for ritual bathing of kings or priests and it appears to have a part of the ritual life of the entire society there. Now, after understanding the, the remains of the Harappan civilization with one example, now let me move to the various architectural styles that were basically developed due to the influence of the emergence of Buddhism, Jainism and the patronage of wealthy merchant skills in lawyer, royal courtyards, courtiers. The remains of the religious architecture of this phase is basically related with stupa which traces its origin to the Buddhist form of architecture. Learners, a stupa is a hemispherical dome or a mount built over a sacred relic either of the Buddha himself or of a sanctioned monk or a saint or a sacred text. The relic was generally kept in the cassette in a small chamber in the center of the base of the stupa. Encircling the stupa was an important activity. So, we find lot of railings around the stupa which gives it a beautiful architectural look. Now, in terms of its functional aspect, the stupa worked as a focal point where believers of the sect gathered and shared the doctrine of the religion. We have discussed this in the earlier units also that the construction and the maintenance of these monuments was taken by the donation of nearby villages to the monument. So, these monuments functioned as local self-governed institutions. They were supported not only by the religious groups, but also by the local community also. So, when we discuss the religious architecture of India, we must understand that it has a metaphysical aspect involved also into it with reference to the sacred beings. So, we had temples which were there in the houses also and in the local area. The Hindu temples were, decide, were designed for uh, worship like other temples. However, uh, the structure was very different according to the region and the style of temple. In functional utility, the temple played a very crucial role. Temple was a concrete place where people used to spend time for devotion. It was a symbol through which common man identified himself with the religion. The temple also functioned as a tool to implement and demonstrate the differentiation based on caste. Uh, at uh, times we do find that temples also functioned as a kind of a bank, a treasury where common people could even deposit money. However, uh, we have lot of invasions that took place such as uh, the invasion by Muhammad of Ghazni where the famous temple of Somnath was plundered because of the wealth the temple possessed. 
So, when we discuss the features of the Hindu temple, it comprises of basically a sacrum or a garbhagriha, um, literally means the main deity. Then we have a small cubicle with a single entrance which grew into a large chamber over times. Uh, the garbhagriha was the main place where the priests used to perform all the functions as well as the ceremonies. Then we had a large hall that incorporates space for large number of worshippers and is also known as Mandapa. These temples uh, were built according to various styles. I hope you have read about these styles earlier also. We had the shape of carving shikhar in northern Indian style and a pyramid tower called a vimana in the southern Indian style. So, we have different styles of temple making. We, uh, the, in the case of uh, the main deity, uh, the entire arrangement in the temple was according to the faith and the member of the society who were managing the temple. We had lot of painting and sculptural work, the entrances of temple were beautifully carved and we have lot of exterior walls which were painted with mythological stories also. So, today these temples remind us of our past and the architectural brilliance of craftsmen in those days. Some of the famous temples are Bradeshwara temple, Tanjore, Kailashna temple, Arola, uh, Tungnath temple, Uttarakhand, Adi Kumbheshwar, Tamil Nadu, Jagatpita Brahma Mandir in Rajasthan. So, a lot of sculpture related activity and painting was integral part of the decorative features of the temple. Most of these architectural remains have survived from ancient and medieval India are primarily religious in nature. In different parts of country, we find distinct style of temp temples as a result of geographical, ethnic and historical diversities. I hope you have already read about the Nagara style in north and the Dravidian style in the south. Then we had the Vesera style of temple, which was an independent style created through selecting mixing of the Nagara and the Dravidian order. As the temples grew more complex, more surfaces were created by the uh, authorities for sculpture. So, it added more projections and led to the beautification of the temple. Now, let me just discuss in brief with you the northern Indian temple style. In this uh, style of temple, the temple was built on a stone platform with steps leading up to it. Uh, whereas, uh, in the southern India, we have elaborate walls or gateways. While the earliest temple had just one tower or shikhara, later temple had several. The Garbhagriha is always located directly under the tallest tower. There are many subdivisions of the Nagara temple depending upon the shake of the shikhara. There are different names for various parts of the temple in different parts of India. The most common name for the simple shikhara which is square at the base and whose wall curve or slope inward to a point or a tap was basically focused as the Rekha Prasad type of Shikhara. So, we find lot of architectural terminology that is used and according to the type of the roof, whether it was uh, generally uh, raised to a single point or it was a sloping roof, we had different names available for them, which is basically for further studies. The Central Indian temples are basically different from those of the one which you find in other parts of India. However, the ancient temples of Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan share many similar features. They are mostly made up of sandstone. We still have old surviving structural temples from the Gupta period in Madhya Pradesh. We have the Kalash which is again found in all the Nagara temples of this period. Today, these temples are well preserved by the government and there are a lot of activities that are undertaken so that we have tourists visiting the temple. Again, Udaygiri which is on the outskirts of Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh is a part of a large Hindu complex of cave shrines. So, we have Dyogar in Lalitpur district of Uttar Pradesh which was built up in the early 6th century. It is a classical example of Gupta period of temple. 
This temple is built on the Panchi Atna style of architecture where the main shrine is built on the rectangular plinth with four smaller subsidiary shrines at the four corners. So making it a total number of five, five shrines. Uh, then in the 10th century we had uh, the Yogini temple uh, which is again dedicated associated with the rise of tantric worship after the 7th century. Built between 7th and 10th century several such temples are dedicated to the cult of this tradition in Madhya Pradesh, Odisha and even in Tamil Nadu. An interesting example of temples and visitors is that of Khajuraho. The temples are devoted to Hindu gods. We do find references of Jain temples also. The focus of Khajuraho temple is on human experiences as well as spiritual pursuit. Then we have uh, the Lakshmana temple of Khajuraho which is dedicated to Lord Vishnu and was built by the Chandela king. It is an Agara temple placed on a high platform accessed by stairs. Kandariya Mahadev temple at Khajaraho is again one of the important tourist attractions of central India. So there is a difference in terms of the various architectural styles according to the climate and the availability of local material. Let me discuss with you the Western Indian temples. Uh, the temples of north western part of India including Gujarat and Rajasthan. We find that the stone that was used in the temple had number of colors and white sandstone is common. Then we had black also which was used in the 10th and the 12th century temple construction. We have seen that during this time uh, the Jain temples at Mount Abu and the various temples at Ranakpur are also an important tourist attraction. We have them in group as a form of temples and we are able to understand the socio-cultural and the political influence of temples at that point of time. The Sun temple at Mohodra dates back to early 11th century and was uh, built by the Solanki dynasty. Again, it has a massive rectangular step tank called the Surya Kund in front of it and it is a perhaps the grandest temple tank in India. So we have numerous such shrines which are dedicated to the sun god also as well as the local deities. After discussing the temples of western part of India and the central India, let me move to the eastern Indian temples which include temples those found in Northeast Bengal and Orissa. Terracotta was a main medium of construction and for molding and it, the temples depicted Buddhist and Hindu deities in the state of Bengal. We have famous temples in Assam also and they bear the witness to the import of Gupta technology and the Gupta style of architecture at that point. However, from 12th century onward a distinct regional style developed in Assam and we have the influence of the upper Burma also as well as the role of palas in the creation of a, a home style in and around Guwahati. Kamakya temple a Shakti Peet dedicated to goddess Kamakya was built in 17th century in Assam and attracts lots of pilgrims. In Bengal the style of uh, temple during the period between the 9th and the 11th century was basically influenced by the Pala style which was the ruling dynasty. The Palas were patrons of Buddhist monastic sites also and the temples from their region express the local flavor. We have the Siddheshwara Mahadev temple in the Burdwan district where we have a tall curving shikhara crowned by a large amalakha and is an example of early para style. So learners in this video we have discussed about the different types of temples both in northern India, southern India, central India as well as parts of eastern India. Now after discussing temples let us now move our discussion to the mosque which are religious places for the followers of Islam. 
Islam being a community based religion expected a meeting of everybody at least once in a week. So it was Friday when followers of Islam offer namaz and prayer in the mosque. Therefore mosque is a functional aspect, a place for collective prayer. So in Islam we had the practice of pronouncing khutbah. So it was practiced by with the name of the king was pronounced by the Malvi during the Friday prayer. So the purpose was to spread the message of the king even to the people around. Uh, Kutwa had a religious sanctity too as it was read by Malvi and the followers of the mosque who were, whosoever was attending the prayer was able to get and hear the name of the king. So we have famous masjids in Delhi and different parts of India such as Hyderabad. The largest mosque in India is Jama Masjid, which holds a significant place in the Mughal era. It is made with red sandstone and white marble. The floor of Jama Masjid is remarkably black and white. Its main gateway overlooks the famous red fort and the mosque has a sitting capacity of 25,000 people at a time. It was Emperor Shah Jah under whose kingship this mosque was built. So you find mosques in different cities of India, you find them in Hyderabad, Ajmer as well as other cities such as Muradabad where you have lot of people who are practicing a specific religion. After understanding mosque, now let us move to the architecture of church. It is a different form of religious architecture. It was developed and designed under the authority of the church. So we had the Catholics uh, who had the Roman, Holy Roman Empire and the Protestants who had their own Protestant church. We have famous churches of Goa and they are visited by the uh, tourists across the globe. Along with this, we have churches in uh, uh, metro cities such as Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Calcutta, Bangalore. So you have lots of churches distributed all across the country. Learners, after discussing the religious form of architecture, let us now move to ceremonial architecture in India, which is basically dominated by various tombs and mausoleums. We have a uh, tomb which is uh, again which occupies an important place as a part of the religious architecture. Since Delhi was the capital, large number of tombs were built in around Delhi and these structures are important both from the tourism point of view and the architectural point of view. The important feature is that uh, they were basically influenced by the Indo-Persian style of architecture. Whereas uh, the mausoleums were designed on an octagonal plan incorporating the elements such as the main tomb chamber surrounded by an orchard veranda. Second, it was generally one story high. The veranda had protective spaces supported with barricades. So we find them with both red sandstone during the Mughal period as well as with white marble. Some of them such as the Humayu's tomb is a great center of attraction for tourists visiting Delhi. These sites and its designing purpose was basically decided by the king. This shows the functional importance of the building as the monument was named after the king or one of his survivors. For example, the Taj Mahal we all know is constructed by Shah Jah in the memory of his wife Mumtaz. Again in this, the practice of laying out gardens has started quite early. The Lodhis made it a practice to place their tombs in the mid of a garden in an attempt perhaps to place their remains in a peaceful natural surroundings. This trend continued during the Mughal period also. Babur also started laying out gardens for recreational purposes and he had depicted in his number of paintings also at that time point of time we have found the ruins of the garden as well as uh, the references of gardens and various literary evidences. Jahangir as we know was a great patron of painting. He had a lot of love for flowers and animals as reflected in the miniature paintings of that period. So we have famous Mughal gardens of Kashmir such as Shalimar Bagh in the Nishant Park. 
which stands as a testimony to Jahangir's passion. So learners we have studied it through painting, sculpture and the various literary evidences that are available with us. We are able to understand the functional aspect of the architecture during the Mughal times. After understanding uh, the religious part of the architecture whether it is temple, mosque, church or any other place let me now move to the strategic form of architecture. We know that since ancient times kings and rulers were fighting with each other to expand their territory. So this led to a quest for defense mechanism. In the Harappan culture we have evidence of cities with surrounding walls to protect against invaders. The evidence of the fort in the Indian literature can be dated back to the time of Rig Veda. The Rig Veda mentions the fort by the name of Shatbhuj which translates to a hundred moats. These forts have been described as massive structures of earthworks spread over large area of land. The cities that were guarded with the walls of these forts were known as Pur. So we have the traces of this form and architecture even in the time of Vedas where they had mentioned fort as Durg, classified them into six categories for example the fort protected by men or a desert fort or a mud fort, water fort, hill fort or a forest fort. Again during the modern time Kautalya's Arthashastra states water and mountain fortification to be best suited to defend the important centers. So it has also given specimens of the sources of water also and Patliputra which was the capital of India during the modern empire was based on the principles of Arthashastra. The excavations of these places reveal large scale fortification walls enforcing uh, wooden, uh, play, uh, wooden material also that fortified the entire city. The fortress was surrounded by river Ganges on one side and we had examples of water forts in different parts of India. Therefore the construction of fortification techniques continued and with the coming of Turks in 13th century we had a lot of references of forts. Fortification was done by Turkish and the Mughal powers which reflect their growth of the empire and it was well developed, well managed for security purposes. The use of artillery in the 15th and the 16th century changed the nature of fortification fundamentally. The height and the thickness of the wall was crucial and we again realized that we need to also come up with low end uh, walls so that we can focus on the minimum targets as far as the warfare is concerned. Learners, there are so many forts in India which are visited by the tourists. I am just giving you a few examples like Agra Fort or Allahabad Fort, Gwalior Fort, Chittaurgar Fort, Kumbhalgarh Fort. These are the forts which are well developed by the government also and are promoted for tourism purposes. We have forts in southern kingdom also, we have forts related to the Rajput and the Marathas also which are an excellent example of Indian architecture. Now the Rajput forts basically uh, were built during the time of the medieval period also, and they formed a sol large solid mass. They had their own style of architecture. They used, incre incre they used jali work and uh, observed along with that they had a lot of chajas with brackets. The, the walls and the gates were also ornamented with plants and animal motifs and the material used for construction differed from region to region. Stone was extensively used and gypsum was used for plastering uh, and lime was used for places that need to be secured for waterproofing. With the advent of Islamic architecture in India, with, uh, the Mughals also came up with their own principles of military architecture. The Mughal forts were constructed on strategic positions in accordance with the natural topography. We have the plains of northern provinces uh, which had not much problems but in terms of the hilly areas and other areas the forts were designed according to the regional variations. 
So use of iron as a construction material was also widely popular along with stone and mud. Learners after this I will just take you quickly to the concept of sarais. I hope you have heard this word. The sarais were basically hotels located along the highway to promote the trade. They were managed by local officers who were supposed to maintain the basic amenities and provide safety to the travellers. So we had a lot of evidences that the travellers were welcomed at this facility irrespective of their religion or faith. The sarais were spaces where travellers could stay for a considerable period of time and if they were merchants they could store their goods in these places and there were special arrangements for their security. These establishments were free of charge and they were built by nobles through royal patronage. In city of Delhi, we have number of such sarais such as Sheikh Sarai, Neep Sarai, Katwariya Sarai. These sarais are basically associated with the facilities for transit travellers. In the end of this video, let me discuss with you the masonry bridges. The masonry bridges of medieval India are basically structures composed of arches resting on a series and were carried so in such a way that we can have the road across a stream of water. We have very few bridges which are surviving today and uh, they were basically made up of stone in the ancient period, inherent advantages and were very much used in terms of the transit of the military forces or the merchants. So we find that these bridges were built on medium and small size rivers, uh, even on small uh, gorges and ditches. Um, in case of large rivers such as Ganges or Godavari, we do not possess such bridges until the late 19th century. Some of the examples of surviving bridges are the Gomti Bridge at Jaunpur. A medium sized town in Uttar Pradesh, the bridge dates back to Akbar period. Then we have the Gambhir Bridge at Chittorgarh in Rajasthan. This bridge is ascribed to Alauddin Khilji's period. Arthrala Bridge near Puri Orissa dates back to early decades of 11th century. So, learners, in this video, we have provided you a glimpse of various architectural forms. We have discussed the practical utility of different kind of architectural designs. We have understood the symbolic importance of these architecture and have also studied that these monuments functioned as a part of the society. They focused on the universal well-being of people and the surviving structures today are prominent tourist attractions. Thank you.